أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <coughs> Over the past few weeks we've been looking at various ulama from various mazahib from various parts of the world and their texts so if you remember just two weeks ago we looked at we looked at Imam Abu Yusuf rahimahullah ta'ala Qadi Imam Abu Yusuf who is a student of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala and we discuss the the letter of advice that his teacher wrote to him just the first point that he gave to him last week we looked at Imam Malik rahmatullahi alayhi his muwatta and we looked at a sharh a commentary that was written on that by a scholar from India Aujazu al-Masalik ila Muwatta al-Malik so we looked at that book and the scholar in that tradition I want to move on and look at another great alim of our tradition and his books one of his books is called At-Tafsir al-Kabir which is also known as Mafatih al-Ghayb is written by a Shafi'i scholar so I wanted to make sure that we have good representation so Imam Fakhruddin Muhammad bin Umar bin Hussein bin Hassan very very telling given what's happening in Muharram Ibn Ali al-Tamimi al-Bakri al-Razi al-Shafi'i rahimahullahu ta'ala I was looking at the tafsir of zakat at the moment I'm studying and looking at with my students the chapter of zakat in the fiqh text and I wanted to see what other ulama have written when it comes to charity or zakat in particular this surah this chapter in the Quran surah to Tawbah verse number 60 is where we have the evidence from the Quran from the Nas as we call it about whom to give your zakat to Allah mentions in the Quran in namasadaqatu lil fuqara'i wal masakin wal amilin alayha wal muallafa di qulubuhum wa fi riqab wal gharimina wa fi sabil Allah wa ibn sabil fariqatan min Allah wallahu alimun hakim so Allah says in namasadaqat sadqa the ulama when the word sadaqat is used here the ulama agree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about zakat in particular. The word sadaqah can also be used for zakat. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you eight categories that are defined by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lil fuqara wal masakin, the poor and needy. Wal amilin aliha, these are people who are responsible for collecting the zakat, distributing zakat. Wal amilin aliha, the administrators. If you had been living or you are around in the Muslim world or you're living in the Muslim world the state would be responsible for ensuring that this money is collected correctly and distributed to the people who deserve it and to bring those people's hearts towards Islam those people who are enslaved those people who are in debt وَفِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ and those who are in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gone out in the path of Allah and have suffered financially as a result of that وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ and the traveller usually someone who's left their home gone to another city or another town and have nothing with them to make it home safely فَرِيزَةً مِنَ Allah. Allah then adds that this is an obligation this is something that Allah has decreed himself وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ two sifat Allah is wise Allah is all-knowing Alim, Allah is all-knowing and Allah is wise. So in this discussion, I wanted to see what the ulama have written. And it came to my attention here when I was looking at this tafsir in the Mafatih al-Ghayb that before Imam Razi goes into fiqh of it all, he gives you some wisdom. He gives you some wisdom, hikmah, of why um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed fi akhzi al-qalil min anwal al-aghniya. Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed that you take a little bit of wealth, a little bit of wealth from the wealthy. Why is it that they don't have to give all their wealth, or 90% or 50%? Why is it through the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No, it's 2.5%, right? So he looks at the wisdom of this. This is fascinating. He looks at the wisdom of why this is the case. Why is Allah asking us to give a small amount of our wealth, not all of our wealth, not our entire wealth? You are not like Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu or neither are we like Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu. May Allah uh, keep their great shadow over us bi ta'ala. So he mentions a number of reasons. It's very deep but I will try my best for you inshallah to explain it with a little bit of Arabic just so it helps me to explain it for you. He says 
as for the first reason that humanity or human beings seek perfection we like to be the best that we can be and the best way you can achieve some sort of kamal perfection is having qudra power everybody wants to have ability when you have ability you can do whatever you want when you have strength physical strength or financial strength you can do whatever you want so he says the greatest way to get qudra ability is to have financial strength when you have finance, when you have money, you have influence. And we all know this because we live in the West, we live in a neoliberal society, and we see with our own eyes what money does. If you have money, then you have a lot of influence. You have a lot of say in how things are done. This is true, Yani. We see this with our own eyes. When you have money, you can do a lot. So the Sheikh says that this is why when person has a lot of wealth and he has um, the ability to do whatever he wants, and في حق البشر فكان أقوى أسباب القدرة في حق البشر هو المال. That the wealth is the greatest form of power, especially in our day and age. When you have wealth, you have a lot of influence in policy. I don't need to give you examples because it would go on for a long, long time. But he says that this power in of itself, this قدرة that you have, this ability that you have in of itself, can also be dangerous for you. It's not haram in of itself. It's not haram to have wealth. It's not haram to be wealthy. The Sharia does not say that you can't be wealthy. If that was the case, why have our fuqaha spilt so much ink in the books of fiqh, writing Kitab al for example, or Kitab al-Ijara, finance, to do with transactions, to do with rental contracts, to do with all of these things? Why have they spent so much time writing about these things? Because they know that humanity needs to flourish. And one of the ways they flourish is through wealth. So financial prosperity is nothing to be afraid of. It's not haram in of itself. So the Shaykh continues that this can become sometimes, this qudra, this wealth can become mahboob to you. It can start entering your heart and it starts to overwhelm you. But becoming enamored with wealth can become such that there's a risk that rather than being infatuated, rather than being in love with Allah, you become beloved to wealth. You love wealth instead. So Allah out of his wisdom has created this mechanism of giving charity to protect you. Look how beautiful it is. It's for your benefit. Because often when we think about giving charity, we think that oh, it's a burden upon us. Oh, we're helping the poor. But the Shaykh is saying first benefit, first wisdom is you. You're going to benefit from this. Right? Right? المال بإخراج طائفة من منه من يده. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has decreed through His wisdom that give some of your wealth to counteract the forces that enter your heart that will make wealth beloved to you. In other words, wealth is good for you, but too much of it will be harmful for you. So Allah's wisdom is such that He loves you such that He wants you to give some of it to protect yourself as well. ليصير ذلك الإخراج كسر من كسر من شدة الميل إلى المال. That it becomes a way of breaking this intense love for wealth. Some people, they love wealth so much, that's all they live for. And that can lead to an evil and we seek Allah's protection. But some people, mashallah, Allah blesses them with immense wealth and they use that wealth for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is what he's saying. وَتَنْبِيهًا لَهَا عَلَىٰ أَنَّ السَّعَادَةَ الْإِنسَانَ لَا تَحْسُلْ عند الاشتغال بطلب المال وإنما تحصل بإنفاق المال في طلب مرضات الله سبحانه وتعالى. Allah is reminding you that that your felicity, سعادة, your happiness, your felicity is not in being engrossed in seeking wealth, but it is in spending wealth to please Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Your pleasure lies in spending wealth to please Allah سبحانه وتعالى. So Allah has made this zakat wajib علاج. As a form of cure for you, hmm? that it removes this disease. He calls it a marz, marz hubb dunya. This love of wealth, that or the love of dunya, that can kill you. This is what uh, the wisdom. The first wisdom is very, very important. The Sheikh mentions, and it's very, very fascinating. When I read this, I only read this yesterday. That the Sheikh mentions that you would expect when he was talking about wisdom, the first thing the Sheikh would say that it benefits the poor. But the Sheikh is saying, no, you're going to benefit first and foremost. That wealth and spirituality are connected, subhanAllah. Can you see? They're not opposites. There's no tazad. They're not like opposites. It's not like being wealthy will be harmful to your spirituality. Not necessarily. It's not lazim. 
It's not that it's a connection. It can become a good connection. It can become a harmful connection where the choice is yours. So Allah has decreed that you give small amount of wealth from the wealth you have. And in the fuqaha, they talk about how it's only from productive wealth. Wealth that is productive, malin nami, they call this in the books of fiqh. Wealth that is productive, that you give zakat from that. Not wealth that is not used for production. So this is the first reason the shaykh gives. I call this the ability uh, wisdom. The second wisdom the shaykh mentions, he goes into a lot of detail as well, that when you have a lot of wealth, then you have greater ability and more you seek more to do with that wealth. You want to do more with that wealth. And the more wealth you have, the more power you have, the more wealth you want to gain. So it creates this vicious circle. Wealth, influence, you want more influence, you get more wealth. You want more influence, you get more wealth. And it creates this vicious circle. Right? You just want more and more wealth. That you, nothing will stop you. So he says, in fact, you'll get less that. You'll start enjoying just accumulating wealth. Some people, they have so much money that they don't really need the money in of itself. You get to a level. There's been studies where how much wealth do you need? Right? Some people get to such a stage that money is not really their objective. They just, enjoy, they just enjoy getting more money because it gives them more influence. We all know about this. How much do you need? Like You need to live comfortably. Right? After a certain point, it's probably going to reach a flat line where wealth isn't really something that you need so much. Rather, you want to use that wealth to gain more pleasure, more influence. You can buy more companies, perhaps. You can inform or shape public policy. If you buy social media companies, for example, you have immense, immense ability to influence people. If you own news corporations, imagine how much influence you can have or you already have. People have influence through these corporations on society. They shape our perceptions of the world. Most of us get our information from media channels. We don't really have the ability, illa mashallah, to use our intellectual capacity and think, now nah, that might not entirely be true. Or maybe they, they're pushing this agenda at the moment. Right? I don't want to give you examples because I don't want to be accused of peddling conspiracy theories. What I'm saying is the media is always pushing a narrative. And it's, even though the organizations seem to be independent, they're all pushing the same story at the same time. So what's really going on? That's because these people have huge amounts of influence. So the Sheikh says that sometimes what happens is the more wealth you have, the more you enjoy acquiring that wealth because you have more influence in society. Like it becomes a perpetual circle. It is running after the dunya, running after power, running after influence as well. And he says that sometimes it becomes such that it leads to a person's harm. It's harmful for you. For us, but the shar, so the Sharia intervenes laha, um, to destroy this. So what the Sharia does is that instead of you seeking pleasure for yourself, it redirects it and makes you think about seeking the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Acquire that wealth, but not for influence. Not for evil ends, but rather to seek the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's interesting because I highlighted this. The Shaykh again does not say that it's haram to acquire wealth. It's how you intend to use that wealth. What is your intention? This is the first hadith in Bukhari that we read. In Nawal Amal bin Niyad. So the wealth in of itself is not haram. But how do you use that wealth? So the, the, by giving in charity, it's a reminder to you whenever you give in Ramadan, whenever you give charity, to remind you that the wealth that you have should be sought for the sake of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that um, it removes this darkness from your heart because wealth has this corrosive effect on your spirituality. So by giving in charity, it redeems you in certain ways. Then he says um, the third reason, and by the way, when he talks about the second reason, he says that when you're in this circle, it's like a trap. Subhanallah, how many people, you know, you see these images nowadays, um, you might have seen images, people going to London and working on a tube, they go in the morning and they're like in a rat race, they work, come home, work, come home, work, come home, that's all they ever do, they're trapped in the system, the Sheikh is describing that, what wealth does, when you pursue it, without tasawwuf, without spirituality, without Allah, then it becomes a perilous trap for you, it, you become entrapped, I've met people like this many, many times, who say to me, Maulana, I'm just stuck in this rat race. I've been working for 50, 60, 70 years in this company and in lots and lots of money. I'm just stuck in the system. I have no way out. I can't think of another way out. I can't leave this company. I have no other way out. 
Because it, that's what wealth does. That's what this dunya does. It traps you into it. It ensnares you. So he says that by giving in charity, it's, it's a way out for you. It's a way out to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then he gives the third reason, al-wajhu thani that kathratul mal sababun li tughyan that when you have too much wealth it can lead to disobedience it can lead to uh, uh, he even says wal qaswal fil qalb that your heart becomes hard aw ashaddu qaswa Allah mentions in the Quran as well that your heart becomes like a rock what does it mean it's not literally becoming a rock but it means that nothing enters your heart you have no compassion you have no empathy for others. All you want is wealth, wealth, and more wealth. وَالسَّبَبُهُ مَا ذَكَنَا مِنْ أَنَّ كَرْتِ الْمَاسَ بُلْحُسُ الْقُدْرَةِ Okay. وَالْعَاشِكْ إِذَا وَصَلَ لِمَعْشُوقِ إِشْرَغَ فِيهِ That when a person becomes such that he loves wealth so much, he becomes like engrossed in it. You just like, wealth is all you see. Just whenever you meet people, you don't see a person, you see someone you can make money out of. That's what happens to certain people as well. فَلْ إِنسَانُ يَسِيرُ غَرْقًا فِي طَلَبِ الْمَالِ That he becomes, he becomes such that he becomes like drowning in just seeking wealth. That's all he ever wants. And then what happens is when he finds someone that stops him. فَإِنْ عَلِذَ لَهُ مَانِعٌ If he finds some way that يَمْنَعُهُ عَنْ طَلَبْ from, from that wealth, then he, 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 kind, he goes out of his way to stop that person. Yani he'll do oppression. Because he's so in love with wealth, he will break whatever law he has to break. He will do what kind of zulm he has to do to get that wealth. You've seen that with families when arguments happen between families about inheritance or when it comes to sharing wealth amongst themselves. When a person becomes so enamored with wealth, I don't care about the Sharia. I don't care what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran. Right? I just want my share because I did more for my father or I did more for my mother. Or people will do much worse than this. We hear stories of much worse than this. So this is how it becomes dangerous for you. So he says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made zakat wajib yuqall tughyan and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reduces through giving charity this love of wealth, reduces oppression, you reduces zulam. All three that I've mentioned so far my friends, all three of them are to do with you. In other words, when you give zakat, who are, who's benefiting first and foremost? You are, the donor, the one who is giving. Never ever think that when you're giving charity, you're benefiting the poor first and foremost. You are benefiting your own nafs, your own self, your own akhirah first and foremost. Then he gives the fourth reason, that he says, and this is slightly interesting as well, that human beings have two strengths. نَظْرِيَّةٌ وَعَمَلِيَّةٌ فَالْقُوَّةُ النَّظْرِيَّةُ كَمَالُهَا فِي التَّعْذِيمِ لِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى وَالْقُوَّةُ الْعَمَلِيَّ كَمَالُهَا فِي الشَّفَقِ لِعَلَى خَلْكِ اللَّهِ that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you two strengths. One is this intellectual strength, right? To honor Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the second one is Allah has given you physical strength. You have two strengths. You have this strength in here, to, uh, the ability to use it in the right way. But you also have physical strength that Allah has given to you. فَأَوْجَبَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى الزَّكَاةِ لِيَحْصُلَ لِجَوِ الرُّوحِ هَذَا الْكَمَالِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made zakat wajib so that the ruh can acquire this sifat of being charitable, being well endowed, helping other people, and to be good muhsin إِلَى الْخَلْقِ To do ihsan towards people. Allah makes it so that when you give charity, you, you, you feel charitable towards people and Allah says in the Quran what in Allah yuhibbul muhsineen Allah loves Allah loves those people who are doing ihsan who help other people in other words by giving zakat you are attracting the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again you're benefiting can you see the first three was to protect you now the fourth one is to elevate you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi isal khayrat ilayhim dafin al afat anhum because what are you doing? You are giving benefit to people by giving them small amount of wealth, but you're also removing some harm from them. You're benefiting other people. So Allah loves people who do ihsan. Allah loves people who help other people because this is Allah. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. So we are endowing our lives. We are bringing into our lives the very attributes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. Wali has a sir qala alayhi salatu salam. Because of his secret, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Takhallaku bi akhlaqillah. Endow yourselves with the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, become like God. How Allah is generous. Allah gives. Allah gives. Become like that. So the fourth benefit here is for you. Now you're benefiting because you're, you're feeling 
generous towards other people. And we know that when we do good to other people, it creates a, vir it creates a virtuous cycle. When you help people, when you go out of your way to help someone, then that creates benefit for them and also benefit for you as well because you are becoming something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants you to become. Then he says the next one. This is very, very fascinating. This is the fifth one, which is, I'll tell you the summary. By giving zakat, you're creating a positive society. You're creating what I call a virtue-based society. The zakat is not only for you to benefit, but it also benefits a wider society. When people realize, recipient, when people realize that this person is giving me zakat, when musallis from here go to places in the Muslim world, like we do, mashallah, where we've been to Jordan and other places in Africa where we've been, when we go there and we help these people, it creates love in their hearts for us. It creates positivity. They feel that Muslims in England who have wealth care about us. They've come to our lands where we've been, we've been under war or we've been under famine or whatever else it may be. And it creates a positivity amongst them that these people have come. They've left their homes in England. They've left the comfort of their homes to come to our land to support us while we are suffering in these tents as well. And so what happens is when people see that you're doing ihsan to them, it creates goodness in them. This is what Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Jubilat qulub ala hubbi man ahsana ilayha. That when someone is good to you, your heart naturally begins to like that person. When someone does ihsan upon you, when someone favors you, when someone gives you something, it creates love between you. And in the hadith, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, what does he say? Tahadu tahabu. Give to one another. Give gifts to one another. Why? It will create love between you and that person. It will remove animosity. I was with my daughter just before we were talking about the virtues of salam. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that the person who gives salam first, bari um min al-kibr. He is free from pride. Hmm? Because a person who is proud will want, won't, will want everyone to come to him. But a person who has that under control will want to be the first to give salam. In other words, they want to be first to do something. They want to give salam first. They want to be the one who does good first. So what this does, the next benefit is that it becomes a means of creating positive Baraka, goodness in, our, in other communities. When we go out and we give our wealth that Allah has blessed us with to people in uh, the Arab world or in, in, in Africa or whatever else it may be, immediately our musalla, musalla here is benefiting as well because of the khair that we have done there as well. So this is another benefit that Sheikh mentions. The next one, I've missed one out because it's a bit too much in detail. The next one the Sheikh mentions is that أَنَّ mal سُمِّيَ مَالًا لِكَثْرَةً that mal, one of the reasons mal is called mal is that meal. Meal means to uh, incline towards something. He says mal is called meal, it's, it's come from the word mal, meal, which means that everybody inclines towards wealth. Everybody wants a bit of wealth. Everybody wants a pay rise. Everybody wants more money because they want to feel comfortable. He says, but this sometimes can become harmful for you. And zawal. And the problem with wealth is that it disappears quickly as well. That it comes and it goes. It comes and it goes. And so it can be very deceptive in nature. This is what the Sheikh is saying as well. As soon as you have it, it kind of disappears as well. Subhanallah. Why does he say? How can I translate this? When a person spends his wealth in goodness, in khair, in benefit, then that wealth remains. You say, Malana, how does it remain? You just said to us, the Shaykh has just said to us that when we spend our wealth, money comes and goes. So how is it that when we spend in the path, a lot of money stays? So he explains, فَإِنَّهُ يُجِبُ الْمَدْفِ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالثَّوَابِ الدَّائِمِ فِي الْآخِرَةِ That wealth remains. Why? Even though you spent it, that spending is praised in the dunya and in the akhir you get eternal reward for it. In other words, that money will never disappear. Do you understand this? It's very, very daqiq. It's very, very fascinating because money comes and goes except that money which is spent in the path of Allah. Except that path money that is spent to seek Allah's pleasure, you will always get a reward for that. That money has not lost. You have not lost that money. So when you spend and you give in that box over there or you give online, that money you're giving is for your eternal blessing. It's for your eternal salvation. And he says, somebody said, Al insan, so this is a saying he's saying, Al insanu la yaqdiru an yathaba bi zahabihi ila al qabr. 
that a man cannot go to cannot doesn't have the ability to go with his gold gold to the qabr a person cannot go to the qabr qabr with his grave because he's dead but then he says faqultu bal yumkinuhu dhalik but it is possible فَإِنَّهُ إِذَا أَنْفَقَهُ فِي طَلَبِ الرِّزْوَانِ الْأَكْبَرِ فَقَدْ ذَهَبَ بِهِ إِلَى الْقَبَرِ وَإِلَى قِيَامَةِ But he says that when you spend it in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that wealth comes with you. That wealth comes with you. It comes with you into the grave. Not physically speaking, but it comes with you into the grave, into your akhirah as well. So this is the next benefit. Now we get shorter. He says, وَالْوَجْهُ الثَّامِنِ that this is, you know, we all have to have good sifat, good attributes. And one of the best attributes that we can have or we can mimic is the malaika. We can't become like the malaika, but we can become pure like the malaika, even better than them because they are pure beings. They are beings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who only but obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says, Wahua, that when you spend your wealth, you are resembling the malaika and the anbiya. You know, if you want to be closer to the pious people, you resemble them. So you want to be like the prophets, you want to be like the angels, spend. Spend in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, because this is the way they are, because they give. The prophets always give. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa never left anything behind. He would come for fajr, maybe he would be given something, then he would meet someone along the way, and they would be needing, needing something, he'd give it to them. Rasul sallallahu alayhi never wanted wealth. He never held on to wealth. Uh, he spent in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the way of the anbiya. Because they don't leave anything behind except knowledge. As we know from the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from Abu Darda radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this is why he's saying, but when you become bakhil, when you become stingy or miserly, this is blameworthy. Yeah? Then, then it's not worthy for you. So this is the next reason he mentions. The next one, he mentions that when you spend anna ifadat al-khayr wa rahmata min sifat al-haqq subhanahu wa ta'ala that when you spend, when you give goodness when you show mercy upon people, this is like what Allah does. This is exactly what Allah does. Allah shows mercy upon us all the time. Even when we are sleeping, He is merciful to us. When we are deep in sleep, He's preventing so many calamities that could happen to us. He's sustaining us when we are sleeping. Our body is still being sustained when we sleep. Allah provides for us. There's no limit to how much He provides for us. Allah says in the Quran, وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you were try to count the ni'mat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, la you will never be able to count them. So this is, when we give charity, it's like we're resembling how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dealing with us as well. وَذَلِكَ مُنْتَهَا كَمَالَاتِ الْإِنسَانِيَةِ That your, your perfection, your perfection, if you want, lies in following the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like how Allah is with you. Imam Ghazali has the 99 names. He mentions that the 99 names should be brought into our lives. Hmm? So this is how we draw close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's another one which is quite long, so I'm going to leave that. وَالْوَجْهُ الْحَادِ الْعَشْرَةِ The next one, number 11. أَنَّ العلماء, The ulama say, قَالُوا شُكْرَ النِّعْمَةِ عِبَارَةٌ عَنْ صَرَفِهَا إِلَىٰ تَرَبِ مَرْضَاتِ الْمُنْعِمِ That if you really want to show gratitude for something that you have, is to spend it in the way of seeking the pleasure of the one who gave it to you. Spending in the way to seek the pleasure of the one that gave it to you. When Allah gives you wealth, you want to spend that very same wealth to seek His pleasure. Was zakat shukrun ni'ma? Zakat is one of the meanings of hikmah. Of zakat is that you're being grateful for this gift that Allah has given to you. Allah has given you wealth. When you give zakat, you are showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the wealth that Allah has given to you. So this is something very, very important. He mentions a number uh, of other reasons as well, but I'm going to stop there. As you can see, these are wisdoms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sharing and the Shaykh is sharing with us from the Quran. I want to share one more beautiful insight that I found later on in the book and I'll end there inshallah ta'ala. He says that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, listen to this, this is beautiful. I found this later on in the book. It's highlighted here. Al-Iman Nisfan. Iman is of two halves. Listen to this. Al-Iman Nisfan. Ni Iman is of two halves. Nisfu Sabrin wa Nisfu Shukrin. Half is to be patient and the other half is to be grateful. Wal Malu Mahbubun Bittab. Everybody loves wealth, the Shaykh says. For which Danuhu Yujibu Shukr. When you have wealth, be grateful. When you get a paycheck, be grateful for what you have. And he says, Wa Fuk Danuhu Yujibu Sabr. If you don't have it, be grateful. 
If you lost wealth, be grateful. Something happens, you lose a little bit of money for whatever reason, the business deal didn't work out, then be patient. When you have it, when it comes to you, be grateful. Pay two rakat. Be grateful. And if it doesn't come to you, don't shout and scream and argue. Be patient. وَكَأَنَّهُ قِيلَ أَيُّهَا الْغَنِي It is like Allah saying to you, أَعْطَيْتُكَ الْمَالِ فَشَكَرَتَ فَصِرْتَ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ Oh you who is wealthy, I gave you wealth and you were grateful for it, so you became from the shakirin. Then he says, فَأُخْرِجَ مِنْ يَدِكَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنْ حَتَّى تَصْبِرْ عَلَى فُقْدَانِ ذَلِكَ الْمِقْدَارِ فَتَصِيرُ بِالصَّبِرِ مِنَ الصَّابِرِينَ And then, I took some of that wealth from you, I gave you this wealth, you were grateful for it, and then I said to you, give some of that wealth, and from a small amount of wealth that I took from you, remember that wealth that you gave, is wealth that Allah gave you anyway. And he says that you remained patient upon that, you became from the Sabirin. So when Allah gave to you, you became Shakirin. When you gave from the same wealth that he gave to you and you were patient upon that, you became from the Sabirin. This is for a wealthy person. But the Shaykh is not finished. Oh you who is, who is poor, I didn't give you wealth. I didn't give you lots of wealth. You were patient upon this, you are from the Sabirin. You became from the Sabirin. Look at this. وَلَكِنَّنِي أَوْجَبَ عَلَى الْغَنِيِّ أَنْ يَسْلِفَ إِلَيْكَ طَائِفَةٌ مِنْ ذَلِكَ الْمَالِ حَتَّى إِذَا حَلَّ ذَلِكَ الْمِقْدَارِ فِي, فِي مِلْكِكَ شَكَرْتَنِي That then I made it such, I made it such, Allah says, that the rich gave you some of his wealth, and it became halal for you, and you became the owner of it, and you were grateful for it. فَصِلْتَ مِنَ الشَّاكِرِينَ And you became from the shakirin. So the rich is becoming shakirin, and the poor is becoming shakirin. The rich is becoming sabirin, and the poor is also becoming sabirin. They are both having iman. They are both, despite their financial circumstances, are becoming part of those people who have iman. Hmm? So this is zakat becomes what? that both of them the poor person and the rich person are having both of these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of iman that they are, they are patient the poor person is patient when he has no wealth but when Allah gives him a little bit of wealth from the poor he becomes grateful the rich person he is grateful when he has lots of wealth and when he gives a little bit of that wealth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is patient upon that as well. So both of them, both of these, both of these servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala having this beautiful sifat of being having sabr and also shukr. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala endow us all with these attributes of being from those who have patience. Patience in this world, of course, is a very big attribute of the Abiyya alayhi salatu wasalam, our Nabi Muhammad the most. He was tested the most like nobody else, but he was very, very patient. If you read his life, he was extremely patient. All the Anbiya were extremely patient, but they were also very, very grateful for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha would wake up at night and her husband wasn't next to him, next to her, and then she found that, you know, he was praying at night, salah, tahajjud, right? because upon him it was farz. Rasul was praying tahajjud and his feet were swelling, wrong, wrong rak'ad. Not, not, not the mu'awazatayn, any yani long, long rak'at. And he would pray and she would touch his feet. Right? And she would, you know, as a wife would do, look for her husband. And she would find that her hus her, his feet are swollen. And she would say, like, why are you doing so much? Like Allah, you know, like you're forgiven, you, you are the greatest of creation, you have everything. What did he say? Afalam akun abdan shakura. Should I not be a grateful slave? If that is the maqam of our, um, uh, our Nabi, alayhi salatu was salam, then what does that say about me and you? That we should have the same level of gratitude and patience. These are the two wings Imam Ghazali mentions of a believer. Sabar and shukr. Sabar and shukr. If you have both of these wings, you will fly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah give us all the tawfiq inshaAllah. Subhanallah. Bihamdihi subhanakallahumma. Bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayhi.